Active Leader Webinar Series 2020, organized by the Center for A Asia Leadership in collaboration with Invest KL. Uh, my name is Faustino John Lim, and today's webinar is Three Ways to Power Your Teams Through Vulnerability with our speaker, Cody Caton. If you are joining us uh, for the first time, our center is an organization based out of Boston, United States, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, operating in several cities across Asia. We were founded at Harvard University among fellows and alumni, and we are focused on helping leaders in Asia initiate change and manage progress in their organizations and communities. Our center's end goal is to help you promote societies which are thriving, democratic, and just. So wherever you are in the world, although we focus our work in Asia, uh, I wanna acknowledge our viewers from other regions as all of us are really going through tough times now and uncertainty. And we wanna thank you for your support because we are in the midst of a 20 week series. And really the purpose of these webinars is to encourage and educate uh, during these tough times. I'd now like to recognize our speaker joining us from Kansas City, Missouri, USA. Um, Cody Catan is an international leadership trainer and consultant. He started his career in university administration and in the Peace Corps, uh, working in community development in Africa and designing and leading training for the African Union. As a faculty at the Center for Asia Leadership, he focuses on negotiation leadership. Welcome to the program. Cody, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks so much. Super excited to talk to you all today. And uh, I, I heard that you just arrived back in the United States after, uh, after uh, around two years in Thailand. Is that right? Yeah, about a year and a half in Asia. So uh, with you all in Malaysia, then a year in Thailand. Um, yeah, I just got back about two weeks ago. I'm still getting used to the time difference. So it is 10 p.m. for me, but I am like so wide awake because I know it's like morning time over there. So. <laughs> and how, how is COVID in uh, where you're from? I know you're still in quarantine right now. Is that right? Yeah, so I've done just about two weeks. So I'm just now starting to see my family. I saw my family for the first time yesterday. Okay. Um, and co COVID's bad here it is uh it's one of the hot spots it's not as bad as new york or la but it is uh we're expecting a very big second wave so a very real concern okay man well i hope you're staying safe uh but you know it's good that uh you came from thailand where things seems things seem to be under control there actually oh so well yeah her <laughs> ability but so cody what is the importance of vulnerability for effective leadership and how can it help our teams and organizations uh, perform better? So Cody, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. I first wanna acknowledge that poll. Um, I love seeing those results that people feel comfortable asking for help in their workplaces. These are my people. This is what we're all about is getting vulnerable and asking for help when we can. So that's awesome to see. Uh, and, and I love this question, you know, uh, what does it mean for us as leaders and what does it mean for our teams? But I do want us to slow down a little bit before we get into that and really start to ask the question of what even is vulnerability? Let's make sure we're all on the same page here. What is vulnerability? I think a lot of the time when I talk to people about vulnerability, our first instinct is to think of this very negative and almost physical vulnerability, right? Like if I was dropped down into an African prairie and there were five lions around me, then I'd be in a very tough situation. And while uh, I hope nobody here ever has that situation happen to them, it's not what we're talking about at all today. Today, we are venturing into this emotional vulnerability. What does it mean to, to tackle uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure? And so today, everything I talk about and all this framework of vulnerability really got started from one pioneering woman named Dr. Brene Brown, who you can see here. And she's a uh, professor and social researcher who had one really big question. And her question was, why is it that we see some people really feel like they belong at their workplace? Why is it some people really feel like they belong in their family, they belong and they're happy in their community? And she conducted thousands and thousands of these super long interviews and she crunched all the data 
Um, and this really solid data came back to her and it showed that the people who were vulnerable, the people who put themselves out there had a better sense of belonging. They had success in all these realms. So everything we talk about today starts with research from Brene Brown, but then there's been other studies that have come afterwards to really back up her data. So from there, let's uh, start to take on these bigger questions of why do we need vulnerability? Well, vulnerability becomes the key to this sense of belonging. But for what we're talking about today with our workplaces, with how are we succeeding professionally, it also comes down to trust. Now, a lot of us have this idea of what trust and vulnerability is. We have this idea that, you know, I have a friend for five years. And after I've known this friend for five years, then I'm going to open up to them. I'm going to tell them something I'm really insecure about. I'm going to tell them something that's very difficult for me. But research from Brene and from all these other social psychologists really show that we have it completely backwards, that we need to be doing the opposite. We need to be vulnerable first and trust comes after that. So instead of spending five or 10 years to get to know John, I just need to sit down with John really uh, after two weeks, a month, three months and say, hey, here's how I'm feeling, here's where I'm at. And then that's how we're gonna form this big trust bond together for us to move into the future. And so once we see vulnerability in this way, then we stop taking vulnerability as a negative uh, thing in the workplace, in our home. And instead we put it in this super positive light that it's the courage to be imperfect. It's me showing up and saying, hey, I'm not perfect. I have got a ton of faults, but hey, at least I'm here and I'm really trying. And I hope you all will work with me. And in that, it's the only way that we're gonna ever get to belonging. Now, that's just kind of the start of this. There are books and books and books about this. Uh, we don't have time to delve into any of it. So I hope that after this webinar, you go back and check all these sources, read these books, and learn about the crazy different uh, positive benefits that come from vulnerability, because there's so many. And, and before we jump into these questions, I also want to take a side note that, um, you know, I, I want to check my privilege here and check our audience and that we're talking about vulnerability in Asia. You know, this is the Center for Asian Leadership and I am a white dude sitting in America. And so I, you know, I wanna be honest about that and say that some of these things are possibly cultural and there's only so much that what I say is going to uh, fit your context. So I hope that we can open up a sort of dialogue to see what I've learned in my life and what's uh, happening in your life and see if we can find any connection and also have a caveat with that of, um, you know, I've talked about these issues uh, in Malaysia and Singapore and Philippines and Thailand over my past few years in Asia. Um, and I've seen that it's a really needed from a lot of students and from a lot of professionals, uh, particularly because of this pressure to be perfect that we hear so much about in Asia. Um, so I hope we find some overlap there. So that was a lot of uh, kind of building up to this first question. I'm always afraid to just start the question right away, right? And so when we're looking at why is it important for our leadership and why is it important for our teams, it's going to come down to a few big things. And it's all going to start with trust. Trust is one of the most important things in our workplaces, in our families, in our communities. And then trust gives us the power to have great communication and have great assistance to be able to ask for help and get that help. So first, we know we've already talked about how vulnerability builds trust. The next part here is that trust is essential for our teams. Um, this is a quote from Jeff Polzer, and Jeff Polzer is a um, social researcher at uh, organizational um, social structures at Harvard. And he talks about how once you're vulnerable, once you tell the people around you how you feel, you can get all of the small problems out of the way and you can start focusing on the real work. We often feel like uh, kind of tied down by the social structures around us. We're worried about upsetting the person next to us with uh, a faulty email in some sense. And once we start to trust each other, we can get ready for the big problems. We can tackle these really big problems that are, that are hitting us. Now, if we change it and we think about not just for our teams, but for us as leaders, what does it give us to have great trust in our organization as leaders? Well, we need to make sure that the people we're working with trust us. 
Um, I know this series is all about adaptive leadership. And the biggest part of adaptive leadership is being able to motivate the people around you to take on big challenges. And for them to do that, they have to be able to trust you. And so there's all this wonderful research from uh, Fortune and the Great Place to Work Institute. And they've really boiled it down to say that trust between managers and employees is a primary defining characteristic of the very best workplaces. That is crazy to think about, right? That the most important part of the workplace is trust between the manager and the employee. So if we can build trust with the people we're working with, then we're gonna already be putting ourselves on a much better platform to take on those big challenges. Mm. And from there, trust is going to lead to communication. Once we have trust, then we'll have great communication. Now on a team level, what's going on with our team? Uh, there's this common thing that if you don't trust the person next to you, you're not gonna tell them everything they need to be told. You're not gonna communicate all the small things and maybe the big important things because everybody's guard is gonna be up. We're not gonna be willing to talk to each other. Once we have that trust established, then we can really have our communication heightened in so many ways. And then for leaders, you know, we leaders, we have to be communicating with everybody on our team. When we as a leader have an idea, it could very well be a great idea, but we need to hear, uh, you know, the opposing side. What are the cons to my idea? What are the consequences of my idea? If my team isn't willing to tell me about that, then I could really be getting myself into some uh, troubled waters, right? And so building this trust and communication with my team makes it for these controversial opinions and to uh, get these challenges out there for everybody to see and for me as a leader to take on. And then finally, the last part of this is that this comes, uh, it comes all together to make us have great assistance and collaboration on our teams. We want our teams to not just trust each other and to communicate with each other, but we want each other to help each other whenever we have really big challenges. I'm glad to see that our poll shows that people feel free asking for help. But in my experience uh, and throughout the world, people are terrified of asking for help. You know, they want to do everything on their own, both leaders and uh, the whole team. And so when we're looking at our team, it seems that very often insecurities get in the way of our ability to ask for help. You know, uh, I might not ask that person for help because I don't want to show that I can't handle this on my own, or maybe my boss will find out and I won't get that big promotion. But really all of our big challenges, all of our big adaptive challenges require a kind of collaboration. And then for leaders, it is essential. It is so essential that we ask for help. The Harvard Business Review uh, talks about this research from Stanford. And Stanford found that CEOs are constantly looking for advice. They're constantly looking for counsel. They're trying to get all the information they can get to make the right choices. But they're not getting all the information they want. They're not getting the help that they actually need because their teams don't feel comfortable sharing with them. And so if we can establish this culture of uh, truthful sharing, of saying how we actually feel, it helps us to show you know, everybody's ideas. We're taking all of the resources we have to make the best decisions. Now, I'll wrap this question up with, um, you know, something that's just really difficult is that if you buy all of this, if you really dig into this framework, as I, as I see coming all over the place, you think of COVID and it really hurts us in so many different ways. We're having higher levels of stress because we don't know if our organization will exist in the next year. Uh, we don't know about our kids' futures. We don't know about our communities. And so there's all this added stress. And stress tends to lead us to not share as much. It tends to make us close up more and not be as vulnerable. But also, we don't have physical workspaces. So we're not connecting with the people around us. We're not communicating with them, which becomes a giant problem for our work cultures because then we just turn into robots who are typing away and getting whatever work we need to get done, but our sense of culture and community at the workplace really starts to erode. So uh, I just wanna point out how COVID is making these things so much more difficult and that we need to be proactive in developing vulnerability online. Cody, thanks so much for that uh, 
comprehensive introduction on vulnerability and its benefits. Um, before we get to the next question, I just want to remind our audiences, do feel free to submit your questions. We are already have a couple, two from Peter Law. Uh, hello, Peter. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if you have questions uh, during, uh, you know, even before we go to the Q&A uh, session, uh, please do submit them and then upvote the questions that resonate with you and we'll, uh, we'll get to them later, okay? Um, okay, so Cody, what are some concrete steps that we can take to actually practice uh, vulnerability-driven leadership? Yeah, that's the hard part, right? Uh, vulnerability is this kind of abstract feeling talk that we, uh, that we get out there, but there are some really big concrete things we can do. And I'll kind of show you the three different uh, things you can do from you as a person and then from you all the way up to your full organization. So let's start with what can you do as a person? Just one-on-one -on -one with yourself, what can you do? Uh, a lot of this starts with reflection and brainstorming. So I think it's incredibly important, this is something I do and I work with other people, is to reflect on your emotional triggers. If you've got something that is kind of a hot button topic for you, it gets you heated, it gets you more emotional, you tend to lose a little bit more of your control, you need to be prepared to be able to handle that situation if it does come up. You need to be prepared to tell your team, hey, this is a difficult situation for me and I have trouble with it. So make sure you know what those triggers are beforehand, before they get out of control. Um, these triggers are, are a wide range of things for different people. For some people, it's uh, talking about money, talking about romantic relationships, talking about that one big project that you failed on. Um, and you need to know what it is. For me, it's uh, talking about directions. I like in a car, getting around town, I have the worst sense of direction on the entire planet. I'm so bad at directions. And I become so insecure about it because so many people mention it to me. And so when my partner brings it up in the car and I'm having trouble with it, I have to take a moment and be like, hey, like this is a really vulnerable moment for me. I'm, I'm really trying to get better at directions. I know I tend to get heated around this subject. I hope that we can form a positive communication now so that I can move forward and not take all my heat on you. So that's one big thing. The next that goes with this is you need to establish what you will share with other people before you actually share it. We don't want you just going into a room with your team and sharing every dark secret you have in your entire life. That is exactly the opposite of what we're saying. You need to go in and make sure you're being vulnerable in a relatable way but also in a way that is relevant. Is it relevant to your work? Is it relevant to the job you're trying to get done right now? If it's not, then you probably shouldn't be sharing it. So make sure that uh, you have that figured out before you go into that next big meeting. Now, part of this is what can you do one-on-one -on -one with other people? And for this, I really wanted to point out some research that looks at this idea of a vulnerability loop. A vulnerability loop is this idea that if I'm going to be vulnerable with John, it takes both of us to create this loop. So I'm going to tell John, hey, I feel vulnerable about this, and here's something I'm feeling a little shame of, and I really need help with it. And then, John, you have the option of saying, hey, uh, that's really hard for you, and I'm here to support you. Or you have the option of saying, boo, you suck, get out of here. So, John, what are you going to do with me here if I open up to you? I mean, I probably, honestly, it probably, uh, it's probably depends on the state of mind I'm in. I guess maybe uh, it would depend on how you approach me with, you know, your, the type of information. Uh, I mean, just very frankly, honestly, like maybe if I'm not in the mood, I may not be in the mood to hear it. I don't know. Maybe it, it matters, like, I guess the setting. Uh, I mean, that, that's my first reaction, Cody. Yeah, a hundred percent. So uh, those are some great things to think about with this, right? Is that like, I shouldn't, if you're having uh, lunch with your family, I'm not going to pull you away and be like, let me tell you about my weekend. That's probably not the best way to do this. But if I set up a time and you and I have an established relationship and I'm saying, here's a problem I'm having at work and I really could use somebody to talk to about it. Um, if you, you know, signal to me that you're willing to listen mm. and that you're there for me, so what happens is we, is we start this loop. It's not just me opening up. You have to be there willing to listen. 
And then once you're willing to listen, you get this signal in your brain that says, oh, maybe Cody's willing to listen to me. And so you share something about yourself. And from that, as soon as that loop is started, it explodes really, really quickly. We, we start to have this bond. We feel comfortable sharing with each other. We become partners and whatever goal we're trying to accomplish. But it relies on both of us, right? It's very fair for you to be like, hey, I'm busy. Get out of my way. Or I have all these other things to do, right? And so one-on-one, -on -one, we have to be ready to do both. We have to be ready to start the loop, to be the person that opens up. But we also have to be willing to look around the room and say, who's trying to share right now? And that sharing isn't being reciprocated. Does that make sense, John? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think, uh, I mean, what I, what I like, I think, in what, what you're saying is, uh, especially in the, in the previous point, uh, there, there's, an, there's an authenticity. It has to be authentic. But at the same time, it can also, you have to balance authenticity with being strategic. There's a strategic release of information you have to also take into account, right? It's like these two things. And I think you can do both. A hundred percent. And that's hard for, for some people, but it is a matter of, you know, we're wanting you to share really do want you to get your feelings out there, but it has to be authentic and it has to be relevant. Um, you can't fake authenticity. You really can't as hard as people try, but it also can't be about, you know, um, how you got dumped two weeks ago and your heart is broken. That's not appropriate to the workplace and it isn't going to help us reach our goal. So it's not going to be too helpful here. Right. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'll jump off to my final point here is um, what can you do as a group? What can we as an institution do? The biggest thing is that groups need to start signaling vulnerability as one of their biggest values and that they're open to it. So if you are a leader, you should come out and say vulnerability matters to me. Here's how it matters to me. Here's my story with vulnerability. You might have an email chain where you share videos by Dr. Brene Brown and all this other research that shows how effective it is at uh, building our teams. You might call out when uh, there's a certain employee who is doing a great job of being vulnerable and showing their weaknesses and being willing to ask for help. Um, and then the second part of this is to encourage deep fun deep fun. And we've got all the links. You can check out all this research, what all this means in more detail. I hope you do afterwards. But deep fun is this idea that comes from this research that shows that if you take a team and you go camping, and you spend two or three days together, and you go through some stressful situations, you know, you spend real time with each other, then that's going to be a lot better than just having a mixer where the same people who tend to talk to each other talk to each other. We want to mix things up. We want to get people a little bit out of their comfort zone. And the big thing with this deep fun is that if you can get people to tell their stories, then that's going to help everybody start the, those vulnerability loops with each other. Because we as humans, it's hard for me to connect to a robot who sits next to me, who I think of as a person who only sends emails all day long. But if that person opens up next to a campfire about their 10 year journey to this job, about the values that matter to them, about their family, then I'm gonna have a much easier time opening up to them and starting this loop and getting us all into this whole culture of taking on challenges honestly. Cody, I'm just remembering some of my early work experiences where we had uh, team building and you know, in the beginning, it's like, hey, this is a little too touchy feely for me. <laughs> but after you, you know, after you, after kind of struggling through those games and then having fun with them, I mean, I mean, you develop a great, greater, better uh, working relationship with them uh, at the end, you know? Uh, okay, so now we're, uh, thank you so much, Cody, for sharing your insights and your stories. Um, so we are going to now go into the open forum. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have questions, uh, please do submit them in the Q&A box. We already have a lot of great questions, and I believe that we have Peter L Peter Law, uh, who's actually a great friend of our center, um, on the line. So can we put uh, Peter on the line? Hi, Cody. So Peter, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and then also share your question to Cody, to, uh, yes, to Cody. Yeah, uh, my name is Peter uh, from Malaysia. I, I'm the HR and all these strategies 
So the question here is, um, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability does not equal to weaknesses. She also talks about guilt does not equal to shame. Now in the Asian context, uh, it is quite not discussed in public and also not discussed in private even. What are the ways to address this? Yeah, Peter, thank you so much for that, uh, for that question and to hear about your experience. Um, so guilt and shame, I love that you brought this up first place. Uh, so just for everybody out there uh, and what Brene Brown talks about and this whole framework is uh, that guilt and shame are very different things. So shame is this idea that if I lost my job, that means I'm a bad person. I lost my job, I'm the worst, I suck, I'm a bad person, I will always be a bad person, that's just who I am. Whereas we need to shift ourselves to this idea of guilt. Guilt is the idea that I lost my job and that's okay. I made a mistake or there was a misunderstanding, but whatever, I'm still a person worthy of love, worthy of belonging, my life will go on. And so really all of this framework is about us trying to switch our lives over to that guilt stage. And it's very hard for many people. Now, Peter, you're asking about, you know, in uh, some of the Malaysian context, uh, that isn't part of the conversation, um, that isn't happening. And, you know, honestly, you probably know way more about this than I do. Uh, I've conducted some research in Malaysia, uh, talking to mostly students about their relationship with these concepts in school. And what I found is that it is happening. It may not feel like it's happening. It may not seem like anybody is talking about it, but it is happening because people will always need to talk about their feelings. They'll always need to feel a belonging. So I found that a lot of youth are talking about it, uh, whether they're knowledgeable of all of these key words and vocabulary about it, they are actually doing it. Now, as for getting people to, uh, um, to follow this framework or getting people to open up more, you know, it really depends on what power level you're at. If you're a manager or if you're the leader in your group, you can kind of start to get the conversation rolling and say, this is going to be one of our biggest values. Let's take a day to talk about how we're going to make that one of our values, how we're going to incorporate into, into that work. If you're not a manager, if you're not the leader within your group, then it becomes much more difficult, right? And so there, my biggest advice is to, you know, maybe start to talk to some of the leaders around you, show them this evidence that it helps the workplace so much, that it helps employees, it makes employees happier. You know, that's going to be the biggest way to get through to those leaders. And then again, really focusing on this uh, feedback loop of vulnerability. If you can get a feedback loop of vulnerability with the leader of your group or with the other people around you, it really does spread like wildfire once there's these great role models. Beyond that, I don't have uh, too much uh, advice because it is like, it's just a really difficult problem. I'd like to push it on John and see what uh, any of his ideas are. No, I mean, Peter, that's a great question. I think, I mean, just to actually add to what Cody is saying, I mean, I, I and perhaps also uh, kind of integrate some of the adaptive leadership uh, component to this. It's, I think it's a, a lot about um, reaching out to, I mean, in the, actually the authentic leadership uh, framework, there's this idea of a personal board of directors where you have uh, what is uh, confidants and confidants is different than, uh, let's say a stakeholder in a challenge. Like a confidant is someone who doesn't have a direct stake in you know, what you're working through, what, what uh, maybe that person is a completely different industry, but it's someone that you trust, someone that you can, that can give you great feedback, someone that can, you can share your personal stories. Uh, it can be someone maybe from your, uh, maybe your church or your temple or your mosque. It can be someone um, that, you know, it can be part of your sports club or community group. It can be someone from your high school, you know, someone who, uh, is interested in you uh, in a different way that's not uh, professional, but still that person perhaps can give some great feedback on, the, on that. And then I think the, trying to intentionally develop these confidants who can also be allies to you and kind of, kind of give you that emotional support should you decide to, you know, make uh, public 
comments or pub, you know, give comments about vulnerability or about, um, or personal statements, uh, you know, to the public. Um, I, you know, and you know that at least you have these like strong people uh, that can support you uh, on that. Cody, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. You know, I think that's, uh, it's good to broaden our options here in that there are going to be times where in your workplace, it's just not feasible right now. Uh, there, there are going to be times, you know, this is all so contextual. There are places where, uh, you know, from our poll, it seems like people feel comfortable asking for help. There's going to be cultures where you can go in and you can say anything. And there's going to be a billion in betweens. And then there's going to be that culture where you can't say anything at all. And so if you have that situation where you feel on that lower end and you can't say anything at all, then you do need to find a professional confidant or a personal confidant to make sure that your mental health is, is up to beat for the work and life that you're living. So Cody, we have actually a, couple, uh, a few more questions here. So this is from Nizar Farzak. Um, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, so Nizar, can we, can, let's put Nizar on the, on the line, can we un unmute him? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, uh, so please introduce yourself and uh, share your question to, to, to us, to, to Cody. Sure, uh, so my name is Nizar Farsak. I am a leadership and advocacy and negotiations trainer here in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Mm. And I do a lot of work in the Middle East and North Africa and of course Asia, so it's, it's a similar culture where there is this conflation of uh, vulnerability as weakness and therefore if somebody is an authority they think they cannot afford to be vulnerable because it's seen as weakness and so i'm interested in ways that you've tackled it the way i've tackled it for example when i do a training with my, for example muslim students i use the example of prophet muhammad how he used to say for example that you should cry because crying uh, uh, cleanses the heart right so when you so to think of culturally relevant examples, uh, I found is useful. What are other ways in which you can relate the, the importance, because authority plays such a big importance in our culture, how do you relate vulnerability uh, when somebody has a position of authority? Wow, yeah, that is a fantastic question. Uh, and Sarah, thank you so much for that question. It sounds like your work is uh, super fascinating. Too. I, I would love to hear more about it. Um, you know, going from that, I, I think you're on the right page with this. Like, I, I don't know that I have any more ideas than you have and making them culturally relevant. You know, what hits me really big about all of this research, Brene Brown has this research, and now there's all these other Harvard and Stanford uh, professors research starting to go into this field. And it's becoming such a like very clear field of we have all this evidence for why we should do these things. One thing that really hits me about all of it is how incredibly intuitive it is. Like, I would have believed in all of this before there was any research. It just felt right, right? Like you hear it and you're like, yeah, I should be opening up for these reasons. I am an okay person as it is, and I'm worthy of love and belonging, and it's okay for a man to cry. Like, these are all basic logical things. It's just awesome that we have research to back it up, right? And so, I think you're going on the right track of showing how intuition wise it is good on our day to day lives. So the more examples you can show people in whatever context they're living in of maybe this research doesn't really apply to them, but look at Muhammad and how we have all these examples from the Quran or look at how uh, whatever world leader or local leader or local tradition it reinforces that I think is going to be best because the research is there, but unfortunately research doesn't persuade everybody. So the more relevant uh, information you can give to your actual like local situation, I think is best. I'm sorry that that's maybe not the most helpful advice. Uh, I'll be vulnerable here for a moment and say that I really just don't know beyond that. John, do you have any ideas here? I mean, that, no, well, I, first of all, I felt already what you said is helpful, uh, Cody. I think maybe one thing I would say about authority is that there's formal authority and there's also informal authority. Formal authority, it's, it's really based on your position, right? Informal authority, it's, it's being able to kind of have these resources in terms of like, you know, the friendships you are able to make up, you know, let's say across departments, across hierarchies, perhaps your direct boss may not be the right 
uh, may not always be open or, um, you know, to, to kind of building that relationship. But if you're able to kind of do it, you know, horizontally, maybe it's not, maybe your direct boss, but maybe it's another boss. Like, in, you know, you're kind of developing that informal power in a way to be able to kind of develop these like safe spaces. I think that maybe that's one, uh, maybe that's one way I would address that. Uh, so we have a next question, uh, Geraldine uh, Joseph. Uh, so can we put her on the line? Hi. Hi, Geraldine, you're on the air. So please introduce yourself and share your question. Thank you, John. I'm Geraldine. I'm a capacity building specialist from the Southeast Asian Central Bank's Research and Training Center. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cody, for a stimulating session. My question is, um, well, it basically hinges on the fact that vulnerability could be culturally driven. In Asian workplaces, generally, if we demonstrate that we are vulnerable, it might not all go well when it comes to the annual performance evaluation. It may all ultimately be a balancing act. How much of vulnerability to show so you're not seen as incompetent? What is your view, Cody? Wow, yeah, thank you so much for that question, Geraldine. I, that's a, a very big and important question. Um, and, and something I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit is that we do need to put this all into cultural frameworks. Uh, again, I am a, a white dude speaking from my Western American background. And that's not always going to fit into these other cultural contexts. And so we need to give that a very big weight. Now, when you're talking about like how much should you share, how much, uh, how vulnerable should you be in your moment considering your cultural context and considering maybe your, uh, I think even more so your work context. What is the culture in your workplace more so than your cultural context? Uh, the big thing here is I do think it's fair to consider where are you coming from in privilege and power in this situation? Um, I, you know, I'm incredibly privileged as a white man, and, and I feel pretty comfortable doing this at any place. But that is a point of privilege. Like, I am in incredibly privileged to come from that position. Um, almost any woman on the planet to come from that position is going to be an incredibly different story, right? Just because of the stereotypes and the, stereo, uh, the social conditions that we have around this planet. So I do think you need to you need to take the time to reflect. Uh, how is this going to be received, and is it going to jeopardize my work? I obviously, in a perfect world, want everybody to be vulnerable all the time, uh, but I do understand that the consequences are different for other people than they are for me. So I think it's the first place to start is to figure out what is is going to be right for you and your personal pursuits, right? Um, from there, I think it it is a matter of start small. It, if you are really worried that you're going to lose your job, that you're going to lose respect in your cultural workplace, then you need to start small, maybe with one person and see what happens. Um, something I think is always worthwhile is also pulling your superior aside and having a really honest conversation with them, especially if you have a pretty good relationship with them. Once you've gained a little bit of trust and you've shown that you can do your work well, then um, you can really sit down with them and express these things. And I think they'll be on your side and be able to get that cultural uh, whole on group on that side. Uh, but besides that, I don't have too much advice besides just take it slow and make sure that you feel like you're not jeopardizing too much of your career as you're doing that. Yeah. I mean, one thing I also like, I mean, when I've made, you know, honest mistakes, I, well, you have to, first of all, make sure they're honest mistakes <laughs> and you're not, you know, it's, but like when I have made them uh, and I've had to speak with, you know, either people on the same level or even those who are at least in that dynamic, they were, they were above me. Uh, it's just, you know, sh just sharing what your intention was, even if it was a mistake, like at least they know where you what your motive, that your motives were right. And I think, I mean, like, if there is a time where, you know, you encounter uh, where you just, maybe you just messed up. I don't know. Like that, I think that's, that's like the first thing uh, I try to do and explain. Um, okay. So uh, and we can continue the conversation perhaps like 
uh, online and social media. But these are great questions. And thank you so much, Geraldine. Let's go to Francis, uh, Kenneth Hernandez. Uh, so can we put Francis on the line? Oh, so he said that uh, his microphone uh, is not working right now. So maybe I can, uh, maybe I can share uh, his question here. Asian people practice a face saving culture. So how can that culture be changed in the workplace with too much uh, bureaucracy? How can a face saving culture be changed in workplaces with a lot of bureaucracy? Cody, yeah. what are your thoughts on this one? These are not yeah. easy questions. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're throwing the hard balls at me today. Okay, I'm ready for it. All right. Yeah, you know, um, this is a, a pretty similar answer that I'm, I'm going to have again. Like, there isn't one good way to fix this. These are incredibly complicated problems um, that are hard. It could take years to change, right? Um, some of the, my big things are focus on those vulnerability loops. So start with one person. If you feel like you're willing to be vulnerable and you've noticed that there's another person in the workplace who is also willing to be vulnerable, start with that person, build a great vulnerability loop where you two have a really strong connection and then go from there, start to branch out. Now for a team of 200 people and it's just you and you're, you've got a toxic work culture and you're trying to get all the other 200 people to uh, embrace vulnerability. That is just a long road ahead. And, and and we're going to come to different places with that, right? Like, I'm all for you completely saying, you know, I'm going to go slow by slow. I'm going to maybe talk to the leader and get them to embrace it and maybe make some institutional changes, get the group to have some more reflection, make us go through some of that deep fun that I talked about and, and go through all these things. But I do think we need to be realistic with ourselves and say that this is hard work that takes a lot of time especially if you are not the leader of that group. If you're not the leader of the group, it's going to take a long, long time. Now, if you are in a leadership position, if you have more power, then you have the power to start that conversation of saying, we're going to, we're going to rebrand this culture. We're going to take this culture and we're going to start from scratch and let's get everybody in a room and let's talk about why we need to have vulnerability, how we're going to do it and what it's going to add for us. And that's a completely different thing. So I, I just want to be completely honest with you all that like, this isn't something that as one person, you can just like go into a room and, and kind of fix all the problems in an afternoon. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it also like one thing I know is if you're leading a meeting, uh, just have like a simple practice in the beginning, like, just, just trying to figure out, like get to know people on the personal level, at least know what they did uh, on the weekends, or at least have some kind of question where you can kind of reconnect on like a human level. And if you are the one who's setting the agenda, you, you know, that something like that institutionalizes it into your culture. Um, so Cody, that was actually, I didn't give you a signal, but that was actually the last question because we're already <laughs> actually over time. Uh, but I love this conversation and, uh, you know, it's good that we were able to, to uh, so before we go, I'd just like to give a couple more, uh, just a short announcements uh, about what, what's happening at our center. And so uh, next week, uh, so the COVID era has hit the experience economy hard. So whether you are working in retail, restaurant, tourism, live events, or even in operations, human contact has always been a key factor in your business's success. So, but yeah, we still have the power and ability to adapt and design for our future. So join us next week. We will continue our webinar series with designing experiences in the COVID era with restaurant entrepreneur and director of innovation at MK Think uh, Signal Edinburgh. And uh, if your organization uh, is interested in bringing a customized learning experience. Uh, we do uh, just want to remind everyone that we are offering programs in person, online, and also hybrid, a uh, mixture of both on several topics. Of course, we focus on adaptive leadership. We also have uh, strategic foresight, how to think like a futurist, uh, becoming a professional thinker, persuasion, power and influence, and also negotiation. So uh, Cody is actually one of our negotiation uh, trainers, and he focuses on that as well. And so now in case you are curious about our programs, uh, like our in-person in-house programs, please do continue signing up 
for our webinars. You may also sign up to Cal Online, which will be free for a limited period. Please go to online.asianleadership.org to take advantage of our top video series on leadership and innovation. Uh, I say this, I give this announcement every week, but I'd like to remind you guys about our forum that was originally scheduled for May 2020. It has now been moved to November 6 in Kuching, November 9 in Kuala Lumpur, but actually we will be sharing some new announcements about this in the coming weeks. So please do stay tuned for updates on this program. A lot of exciting things are happening behind the scenes. And lastly, do feel, please do uh, connect with us. So Cody has been very generous in sharing uh, his LinkedIn uh, as well as his email. If you have uh, personal questions, as long as it's not too lengthy, I, I think uh, maybe Cody can, is, uh, uh, will be generous to kind of share a bit more. Uh, maybe he can also continue the conversation on social media as well. Sorry, Cody, I'm putting you on the spot. But, I love it, I love um, it. And, but also feel free, please do connect with us uh, on our website, um, on our LinkedIn and other social media platforms. My uh, information is there as well. Uh, you can contact me also at the email here at, at Cali at Asia Leadership, uh, .org. And I also want to uh, recognize our, our partner, Invest KL, who is working on helping emerging companies uh, with their growth strategies um, in, in, in KL, Malaysia, and uh, across uh, Asia as well. And lastly, uh, just thank you for your time today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. If you're on the other side of the world, we hope that you have a nice rest. So stay safe, uh, fight the good fight of making our organizations and communities better. And if you could fill out the exit survey that will pop up when uh, at the end of this webinar, please do so. Your feedback is very valuable to us uh, and it will help us continue to improve our webinar programs moving forward. And please do provide your ideas. And with that, thank you so much. And we hope to see you again next time. Thank you, Cody. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would love to hear uh, from everybody. I'd love to keep the conversation going and talk about these questions. So please, anybody feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or email. Okay, goodbye. All right, see ya.